when I first started in real estate, you just had to do your callbacks on a Monday to be doing twice as much as the next agent. But as the industry has evolved, everyone's pretty much working at a high level. They're all doing their callbacks and they're all doing the same things. So it's become a game of inches now. You might be doing 5% more here. You might be doing 2% more here and 3% there. So it's become a game of inches where collectively all of those key differentials add up to where you might be 15% over and above the next agent that the owner's considering. So that's something that's evolved over time. You are listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. Each episode, we bring you the best minds in business and real estate to help you list more, sell more, and elevate your results. To connect with all things Elite Agent, including the latest news, coaching, and features, subscribe at our website, EliteAgent.com. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate Podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent, and once again, joined this week by Mark Edwards. Thanks for having me back again, Sam. When are you going to do one of these interviews on your own? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I've got, got, got a crowbar you away from the microphone. You keep turning up for the intros, but you keep ducking the interviews. Go again. Yeah, moving right along. <laughs> ben Collier. What a guy. Yeah, really an interesting guy, obviously on the cover of our current issue of the magazine. Mm -hmm. Ben is a really interesting guy. So, you know, like he doesn't give many interviews. No. You know, he's not the sort of person that craves being in the spotlight. Yeah. But I ended up having a really great chat with Ben. Well, when you walked out of the uh, podcast and we said our goodbyes to Ben, uh, you actually said to me, I think he asked me more questions than I asked him. The one thing, you know, that's really come through in the last 12 months is that the top performers ask more questions, mm. particularly when they're negotiating. Mm. And that's what Ben says his superpower is, is, is his powers of negotiation. So, yeah, it did occur to me that he was much more interested in me normally than when I interview other agents like he had, you know, within the first 10 minutes, he'd asked me about my holidays, he'd asked me about my daughter, he had asked me about the business. He had asked me about what makes an elite agent like. So he basically built up a bit of a profile on me mm. very, very, very quickly. And I sort of thought, okay, well, that stands to reason. He who asks the questions has the power. We called the story the loyalty effect. You know how in the industry everyone always says, oh, play the long game, play the long game? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The game that Ben plays is not the long game, it's the lifetime game. Mm. Obviously, he sells some of Sydney's biggest trophy homes mm -hmm. into the tens of millions of dollars. But quite rightly, he points out that not everyone starts their property journey at $10 million. It's a really, really interesting listen. There's a lot of great takeaways from, from your chat with Ben. First of all, obviously, check out the cover story issue and the, in the current magazine. issue of, of the magazine. But also in addition to that, there's a lot of takeaways that you've put into the action guide for this as well. Yeah, absolutely. So EliteAgentElevate.com for the action guide. Become a pro member. You'll get all the action guides delivered to your door as well as all of our previous action guides, which are in the vault and much, much more. So to become a pro member and get all that good stuff, as you know, it is EliteAgent.com forward slash pro. There's another really good reason that you should have a listen to this, and it's to do with the way that Ben views his team and views staff development and how he structures his world, basically, mm. so that he can be, you know, he still leads a team, but he is primarily a listing and selling agent, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. And the other thing is Ben is the gun at everyone's favourite word of 2019, off-market. So this podcast is going to reveal a bit about how Ben approaches that off market and basically it's 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 testing the waters. Like you'll hear Ben talk about how he approaches marketing in this, which I think is a really good listen. So if you want to get access to the action guide for this one just on its own, uh, visit eliteagentelevate.com. And if you want to sign up for Pro and just get it all delivered to you, hands, including the magazine, hands free, all of that, go to eliteagent.com forward slash pro. All right, well, let's leave it at that and on with the show. On with the show. Welcome to the podcast, Ben Collier. Thanks, Sam. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here because I know that you're not one to freely give away a lot of interviews and things like that, and I know that you don't actively seek publicity. So thank you very much for coming in yeah, and uh, talking to us about your career because you're one of the most established agents in the eastern suburbs area, which is notoriously competitive, and it's also very hard to break into if you're new. 
Tell us about your journey into real estate. How did you choose real estate as a career? We're going back nearly 30 years now, but when I first left school, I was unsure what I wanted to do as a career path. In the end, my dad sort of encouraged me. We were living in a country town at the time, and he encouraged me to go down to the local TAFE and see what courses there were. And there was a real estate course, which I thought sounded interesting. I started to do the course and enjoyed it, but realized pretty quickly trying to list and sell homes in a small country town was a pretty tough gig. So I decided to move to Sydney. So where are you from originally? Uh, originally Gunnada, and then later towards the end of my schooling, my dad moved to Grafton. Oh, okay, radio. So this is a big shift moving to Sydney. Was it always the eastern suburbs? I was fortunate to go to boarding school in Sydney. The reason why I chose, when, I, when we say the eastern suburbs, at the time more specifically Paddington Mullaris, because I had quite a few good friends whose families lived in those areas, and those areas were familiar to me. But what I also sort of researched was at the time there was a high level of turnover with Paddington Terraces and Mullara Terraces compared to what it was like in Grafton. So what were the early years in real estate like? I guess the only way I can answer that, it's still the same, but it's also extremely different. The introduction of technology and the internet has certainly transformed the way that we go about listing and selling a home and promoting a property and promoting ourselves for that matter. Back then, brands were probably foremost in people's minds, whereas what has evolved over time has not just been a brand as such, but it's been the profiles of individual agents. You've got quite a good digital profile and you've also built a very successful team around you. So tell us a bit about your approach to the digital side of things. For those who know me well know that I'm bordering on technologically inept, but (laughs) I do appreciate and understanding its relevance. Sometimes you can have two or three different speeds and with different markets, but also the way a downsizer may choose to look for a property is very different to someone in their early 20s. So I guess it's me trying to be relevant to all aspects of the market. So talk to me about some of the sales that you've worked on over the last 12 months. I I guess I don't focus on just one end of the market. I've always taken the view that everybody has to start somewhere on their property life cycle. People don't start on their property cycle, well, for the most of us at least, don't start buying their first property for $10 million. Yeah, that's very true. And so uh, what's evolved over time, and I've said this before, is the days when our grandparents bought a house and stayed there happily ever after is not something that we are familiar with these days. So generally, someone may start by buying a one-bedroom apartment that leads into a larger two-bedroom apartment that might lead into a semi, that might lead into a house. They may then scale up to a larger house with a pool. And then as their kids start leaving home, they start to scale down on the other side. I guess I want to be part of that cycle from inception so that you then become that individual or that couple's agent. And then they refer you to their friends and their families and their sphere of influence. And and so therefore, you've got a a far more sustainable business going forward. That's really interesting, actually, because people talk about playing the long game, which, you know, most times they're referring to not trying to list a person's home the second that you meet them. But your long game is actually a lifetime game. Yeah. I mean, look, everybody's different. And Mm. if you only want to focus on selling houses above $10 million, then well done to you. But for me... Those relationships that you've built over that time are fairly significant. So as people progress through their careers, you pretty much get dragged along for the ride. I mean, there's some of my clients who, like I'm, there's one client at the moment, I was fortunate enough to sell him his first house in Paddington. At the time, I think it was $375,000, but we're now acting on the sale of his property for close to thirty. Yeah. And we've gone through the ride through that whole process. Yeah, so in your 30 years, you've you've really followed people through their own property journeys, which is how you're selling those top-end oh, properties right now. If you now. do a great job for someone in that first instance, they want to continue to use you. And I guess that's what appeals to me. Yeah. I mean, there's some homes that I've sold seven times. Oh, wow, okay. Do you know what I mean? You did yeah. a great job on the way in. That was a happy experience. They'd like you to conduct the same process again for them and so on and so on. Yeah. Interesting. So tell me about what your team looks like now. I mean, we did interview a couple of your guys just winding the clock back for the future of real estate, the technology issue. We interviewed five young guns from the agency 
and two of them were your guys. So tell me about what your team looks like today. Well, I'm a big believer in surrounding myself with people that make me look better than what I actually am. So I'm very fortunate to have people like David and Peter and Andrew and uh, Daniel and Emma and Damien. I guess what's happened over the years, uh, and certainly the model of our business, it allows you to create a team within a brand. Mm. And for me, where I'm not just centric on one area, as I said to you a moment ago, some of my clients may have started with a house in Paddington, but over time ended out at Vaucluse or Belby Hill. Uh, so for you to be relevant in those areas, you need good support. And, and that's what where those guys fit in with all of that. Can you break down a little bit just for people that might be thinking about building a team right now that are listening to it, thinking 2020 is my year to take on an assistant or two. Can you break down your approach to developing those young guys? I think when certain agents get to a certain point in their careers, they start thinking about, do I go and open up my own office and be a principal? Uh, For me to work at a very, very high level in, in terms of listing and selling and negotiating sales... I don't think I would be as effective as a principal. And so I sort of made the decision to work within a brand, but to create that same infrastructure that I would have if I was a principal of an office. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, with those guys and myself, we're constantly prospecting, constantly nurturing relationships with buyers. And so for me to appeal to all facets of that market, I need good support. We're coming off a pretty interesting 12 months in real estate and – you know, some people had a bit of a tough year last year. How did you find 2019 and how are you planning forward for 2020? Yeah, I haven't quite seen a year like that before. You know, we I had the biggest quarter I've ever had in Q1. And then we hit the way Easter fell and federal elections meant that for a lot of us, the market pretty much ground to a halt in that period. But as we started to come out of that winter slumber, And we'd been seeing declines at a certain level of the market uh, probably for the last two or three years, certainly under $3 million. Mm. And then as we came out of that winter slumber of that sort of June, July school holidays, it started to kick and kick uh, very quickly. So much so that a lot of the losses or the decline in the market that we had witnessed up to that point had pretty much uh, rebounded square to what it was at its peak. And I've never quite seen that before. So it was a year of extremes. Our volume was down, but our total commissions earned and what have you was almost square to what it was the previous year, which was a record for us. So taking into consideration, we effectively lost nearly four months of trade. We were quite pleased with the end of calendar year last year. Yeah, interesting. And what about moving forward into 2020? What do you see as... Oh, look, I think it's really trying to build on how we finished late last year, we're quite fortunate that we've got some very good listings coming on. And and the way we sort of look at it, as I'm sure a lot of agents do, is we look at each quarter to help set us up for the next quarter. Yeah. And so that's effectively, so you can't just have a lot of stock, you've got to clear it, but you've also got to leverage off that for the next quarter and so on. So that's pretty much how we view everything. Like we're talking about pipeline management here, I guess, at a basic level, that's probably a good way to describe it. So So what you're doing with your team, if I could kind of paraphrase that, and maybe you can expand on it a little bit, is you've got a fair idea already of what might come on in each quarter. Yeah, sometimes you might have pipeline that you you forecast is likely to come on in two years' time. Yeah. And for whatever reason, two years of pipeline falls into six months. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's, uh, I guess we're, we're always looking at not just me, I guess, as the the team leader, but the individuals within the team that we've all got a healthy pipeline going forward and that we've always got something that we're clearly working on Q1 into Q2, Q2 into Q3, Q3 into Q4. That's something that we place a lot of attention to. You're marketing all ends of the spectrum with the team from apartments in particular areas through to big houses, I think. Mm. Was it last year that you had a massive Adams family sell home. And I think you also sold Rona last year as well. Rona was the year before. Year before. Year before. But someone selling a large family home may choose to scale into a beautiful harbourside apartment or they may choose to move into looking for that same lifestyle but would prefer to be on the ground. So therefore they might look at a a home in Paddington or Lara. So 
that's where being relevant to all ends of the market makes a big difference. Yeah, and you've really got to get to know the person and why they want to move and things like Look, that. Some people's journey on this, like a, there was one buyer I dealt with for three years. Yeah. I think as we both went through that process, they were really refining what it is that they were after, you know, and it evolved and it changed over that time. And then I came up with a house that virtually ticked every single box. Yeah, interesting. When you're looking at building a marketing campaign for a particular property, do you start with a particular buyer in mind? Like how do you develop your marketing campaigns? What has evolved for us over the last few years has been how many properties we sell off market. Yeah, okay. So part of our process is we list a property for a campaign. In fact, 40% of all our stock last year was sold off market. That's my word of 2019, off market. <laughs> yeah. And it's I mean, like... Look, and it's not that we deliberately try and sell houses off market. I mean, I'd say nearly 90% of those homes we've listed for a full live campaign. But part of our process is to share that with our database and those buyers that we've been nurturing over a period of time. And invariably what ends up happening is we may receive an offer that's worthwhile considering in the vendor's eyes. But at the very least, what we get out of that process, whether it be two weeks or three weeks, whatever the timeline might be, is we receive critical market feedback. Are we being a bit ambitious on price? Is there a damp smell coming from the laundry, for example? And it allows us to make those adjustments or amendments before we go into a live campaign. I feel and I find that if you are trying to make those adjustments on price and, and what have you halfway through when you are actually live, it's too late. Mm. So it's a bit like doing your homework or due diligence before you start. Yeah, so there's a, a period where there is testing and then you kind of go live. But again, it, you know, it's one of those things where you've got to really nurture your database and you've got to cultivate it and keeping regular contact with those people so that they there feel that the next time you have something for them, yeah, they should probably go and have a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. So somebody like, you know, I think – Josh Fegan's done a number of interviews with someone like Alex Phillips, who is on the phone all day, every day. What does your general day look like from when you get up at, are you a 5am clubber? Oh, look, I'm up pretty early. I've got three kids. Yeah. <laughs> One of who's a rower, so yeah. it's pretty okay, early. It's early. Yeah, yep. it's early. So, um, but it's much the same. I think for a lot of people, they they use technology as a crutch, but Really, the, the key fundamentals of our business hasn't really changed and that it's staying in regular, consistent contact with people, Yeah, whether that be face-to-face -face, in a meeting or on the phone. An email is not going to do that job for you. <laughs> this, yeah. and, and look, Alex is an extremely good agent, you yeah. know, unbelievably good. Um, and so he is very much on the phone all the time, as are we, yeah. as I would assume most high performers are. Yeah, interesting. If you could take yourself back to the early days, now that with your 30 years worth of experience, is there some advice that you would give yourself? Look, we're always evolving. I never feel as though we've reached what I would consider to be our peak. Where I think a lot of agents make a mistake as well is they have a successful outcome, whether it be they secure a listing that's important to them or they secure a, a, a sale. And they'll literally you know, switch off and almost party yeah. <laughs> to celebrate. Whereas, you, you know, when you secure that listing, that's part of the job. You've then got to share it with the overall market and particularly your pipeline that you've got it coming on. And then you've got to work very hard towards uh, achieving a successful outcome. And then once you've achieved that successful outcome, i.e. a sale, you've then got to leverage off it again. By all means, celebrate, but celebrate for 30 seconds. <laughs> like it's, you know what I mean? Because you then... There's nothing worse than having a, a successful outcome, achieving a great result, and then literally three doors down two weeks later, another board's up with someone else. I mean, I know a lot of agents do fall into that trap of securing a whole bunch of listings and then they've got to go into sales mode and so the prospecting side of things gets... You've got to be very disciplined. Yeah. You know, that, you, that all facets of what we do, you're always focusing on. Yeah. Such as prospecting and, and nurturing pipelines and all those sorts of things. Do you have someone that focuses on, on that project management side of things to make sure that... No, we sit down every meeting and discuss who I need to follow up on the listings front, yeah. and my listings pipeline, my current vendors, current buyers and sales that we're trying to close. I mean, that's pretty much the, the basics of it all. But that's not just me. That's also those within my team. 
Yeah. So what would happen, say, if you guys were at capacity and another listing came on and it meant something else had to give? How would you manage the priorities there? Whether you've got five listings or 20 listings, it's much the same. But they're not always all live at the same time. Yeah. You know, that's probably the key difference. Yeah. You would manage when they go live versus yeah. so, so that nobody got overloaded and nobody... Yeah, well, you might... Some might be shown off market, for example. Yep. <laughs> um, there might be five, there might be six, and you might have 10, 12, 15 live listings at that stage. So they, and you just work around it. Yeah. What is the most memorable property you've sold? Funny thing is the most memorable property for me was a house that I didn't get paid for. I had a listing and it was during the GFC and these buyers came and, and my vendors had already bought through me as well. And so I was selling a house. So it was, you know, there was, there was a bit of pressure applied. And a couple came through and said, look, we really like it. We're a buyer at $1.8 million, but our house is currently on the market. It was on the market with a, a, a competing agent. And in the end, I ended up selling that house for them so that they could complete on my listing. So that was a very rewarding experience for me that we were able to achieve that. So it's a it's an unusual one. It's not just the really, really big listings that I get excited by. It's it's more sometimes the circumstances and a vendor backing you and you delivering on the promise. That would definitely put a smile on most people's faces, I think. Your vendor and yourself as the agent want to feel that you've done absolutely everything you can to achieve the best result. And so that when there is an offer on the table, it's worth considering because collectively you feel, well, I couldn't have done anything more. And if you can feel like that with virtually every listing, then you'll have a good year. You're on the cover of our February issue and it took a bit of talking to get you here. While most agents would be and do kind of bang our door down to get the publicity and stuff like that, you kind of shy away from that, which is really unusual in the real estate industry. Why is that? For me, whether it's I feel as though I've got something relevant to say or or to add, but for me, I'm more my priority is more around listing and selling. Yeah, I don't think that what I do necessarily is worthy of that sort of attention, but I certainly like to feel as though we're, I mean we all work very hard. Some people work more effective, I yeah. guess, than others. And uh, I've got a strong work ethic, and as I said, I've got a great team around me. So. I guess you sort of get to a point where people sort of say to you, look, we'd like to hear what you have to say. And But it's but the thing is, I don't really do anything all that much different to anyone else other than the fact that possibly my skill set differs from the next agent in terms of negotiating and, and achieving results. I mean, there are lots of agents who claim that they sell high volume and they sell more properties than everyone else. And that's great for them. But how does that translate to the people that they're acting on? That is the seller and the buyer. So if the results aligned with that volume, then there's a problem there. It is interesting because we were talking yesterday while we were taking a million photographs of you, as as we usually do, and you asked me the question, what do you see makes a good agent? So I'm going to turn that around now. What is it that you think makes a really good agent? This whole process is not about us. Mm. It's about the vendor and it's about the buyer collectively realizing their next chapter in their life. We're there just to help them. Whereas I think a lot of agents tend to make it more about them yeah. and lose sight of that. It's not about us, it's about them. And so you try your, your best to make it a uh, positive experience for both sides rather than one where they're thinking, oh my God, I never want to go through that again. Yeah. So I guess that's how I sort of take the view on most things. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got a young team which has grown over the years. What do you look for when you're recruiting somebody new to join the Ben Collier team? Oh, it's a bit like be careful what you wish for because it might happen, but it's a steep learning curve and, and, you know, you're exposed to, you know, some pretty high-profile vendors and high-profile buyers and, and listings. Your attention to detail has to be at a high level as well. But again, they're there to learn what might be considered best practice, whether it be negotiating or how to conduct the whole process. But eventually they'll get to a point where it's time for them to go out on their own and and that'll be something that we'll celebrate. There was a a fellow by the name of Nick Borden that worked for me for quite some time and he's now the principal of his own agency up at Lennox Head and we celebrated in that. Again, it's not just about me, it's about 
the individuals within my team evolving and developing so that they can get to a point where they can be their own agent, their own person. How does the agency support you in that? Because you just alluded to the fact a little earlier that you were saying that you were a listing and selling agent and it was not necessarily being a principle that appealed to you and the agency are a group which has a lot of support in that way. So, Well, I'm very lucky with the likes of Matt LaHood and Thomas McGlynn who assist me, I guess, working on my business. Yeah. At times you can be so busy with what you're doing day to day, you lose sight of your actual business itself. And at times Thomas or Matt will say, look, look Ben, you seem to be listing and selling more in this area, probably time that you put on another associate agent within your team. Yeah. Focusing on that area, for example. So I'm, I'm very lucky in that regard. I guess the model of the agency is for people like myself to grow those teams. And I guess that's what's appealing as opposed to me trying to manage front office staff and trust accounting and a property management business and all the things that all the verticals that are associated with the real estate office. Whereas for me, my day-to-day concentration is just on my listing, selling and my team itself. Yeah, wow, that's that's actually really good. I sit down with Matt and Thomas fairly regularly. Uh, when I say regularly, probably twice a month to discuss my team and how we're going and whether we're on track, off track, those types of things. Yeah. And so- sometimes they see that as an outsider looking in, they'll see something that you hadn't considered. Look, I have mentors that aren't even in the industry. They're mentors in business. You know, I don't just look at what others are doing just specifically within the real estate space. It might be in the tech sector. It might be in banking. Uh, I draw inspiration from lots of different areas. That was about to be my next question, actually. Do you have a mentor or someone that inspires you? Oh, lots. Lots. Yeah, lots of different people for different reasons. Yeah. Whether that be the culture that they've created within their own business or industry or whether it be technology-based, a whole host of things that you draw inspiration from. I Look, regardless of whether you're a real estate agent, I think in any business you have to be constantly pressing the refresh button. Yeah. Whether that be your website or, or what have you, but not taking away from the key fundamentals of what makes you special and what appeals to people. You've still got to be true to that core, but I think that certainly if you aren't evolving, then you're going to get left behind pretty quickly. Yeah. You mentioned a little while ago that, that your top skill or let's let's call it your secret superpower is your powers of negotiation. What is a tip that you can give other agents on becoming a better negotiator? I guess when I was 18, I sought out who I considered to be the best negotiators. And uh, I basically surrounded myself with those people. And even now, I've listed properties for and sold to some of the best negotiators in Sydney. And I listen and learn when talking to those people. Even though you might be trying to act on their sale or sell them something, you're learning through that process. And so it's something that it evolves over time. And I'm not saying, I'm I, in my mind, I'm not even there yet. So if you if you find a client in banking or finance or... Whatever it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, the reality of it is a lot of the people that we all list and sell to negotiate for a living in their respective jobs as well. Yeah. So it's just different. It's just different. And so it's, I guess what becomes much easier through the negotiation process is when you've been helping someone for a considerable period of time, right? So there's a trust, there's a strong rapport there between you. That certainly assists in achieving a better result. Like, for example, someone that I might have been working with for three years, there's a strong rapport there. And then when you finally find that right house, it's it becomes more a function of, well, what do I need to do to own it? Yeah. The real estate industry has obviously changed a lot in the last 30 years that that you've been in it. And we've talked about a few of those things. But the one question I'd like to ask you is, if there was one problem that you could solve in the real estate industry, what would it be? The problem I find with a seller is they're meeting a lot of agents for the first time. They're all effectively saying the same thing. And I think that when I first started in real estate, you just had to do your callbacks on a Monday to be doing twice as much as the next agent. But as the industry has evolved, everyone's pretty much working at a high level. They're all doing their callbacks and they're all doing the same things. So it's become a game of inches now. You might be doing 5% more here. You might be doing 2% more here and 3% there. So it's become a game of inches where collectively all of those key differentials add up to where you might be 
15% over and above the next agent that the owner's considering. That's something that's evolved over time. It's a lot more competitive than what it was 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, there's a lot of people choosing real estate now as a pretty serious career. And if you are prepared to take it seriously, then certainly there's a period of where you're, you've got to keep your eyes open and your ears open and your mouth shut and, yeah. and listen and learn from those that you consider to be at the top of their game effectively. I, I, I watch some young guys uh, or young people just call after call after call. It's not really establishing a relationship mm. as such. It's a bit like getting spam emails. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's There's no cut through. However, if you're having face-to-face appointments with people, that's different. I mean, look, when I started in real estate, it was at a time where everybody was selling, not a lot of people were buying. And and really, for you to get a sale, you had to have a good relationship with the buyer. And whether that be getting a buyer in your car and showing them one house after the next, after the next, what's happening in that time is you're developing and nurturing a relationship. A lot of people have forgotten what used to happen back then. Yeah. And I think that if you're doing those key principles, then you may not end up selling them. You may not have come up with the right house, but they'll most likely consider you when they go to sell, regardless of whether it be real estate or whatever industry you choose. Try and immerse yourself with people that you consider to be the best in their field um, because you're going to learn best practice effectively. And I was very fortunate that for me, that was uh, John McGrath and James Dack at the time. You know, no one's going to hand you success on a platter. They'll certainly give you advice. It's what you do with that advice, all those suggestions. You know, you can go to as many seminars as you want, but if you don't implement the key things that you consider to be relevant, then go and do something else. Yeah, absolutely. That's just a waste of your time, right? So if you are prepared to implement it and you're prepared to work extremely hard and therefore be effective, then you'll do well. But again, it's a process. It's not going to happen overnight and you have to understand that. If you're trying to develop a relationship with someone who's already got a relationship, there was one one client who's a very good client of mine now. I chased him for 15 years for his business. And every time they would go to sell something, he would give it to his son's good friend who he went to school with. I chased this particular person for 15 years and then I ended up selling something to him it was quite a lot of money for his daughter. And because of that process and the way I conducted myself, from that day onwards, I now do everything for them. You know, sometimes these things as you, might happen within a few months. Sometimes it might be years, decades. So I, I guess understanding that and being patient and remaining relevant are probably the key points that people need to consider. Yeah. And as you said before, making it a pleasant experience for them. Because I'm sure that the customer experience was a major factor in well, you that. Don't, you know, you, you want to be that when you call someone and they see your name flash up on their phone, they're going to answer it. Yeah. <laughs> about, oh, God. No, I'm not thinking of selling or I'm not thinking of buying. Do you know what I mean? You, you want to be at a point that when you call them, it's, you know, hi, how are you going? What's happening in the market? That type of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So what's next for you? Like you've achieved some pretty big mountains in terms of the properties that you've sold and also in terms of growing the team that you have. What's your next goal? It's not just about breaking records. It's building on the previous year's success. It's helping the next person achieve their real estate or or property dreams. You know, and then over time what happens, you tend to get more listings and when you have more listings, you've got more opportunity to have more sales. If someone chooses to come on board with my team, I have a, a responsibility to them to ensure that they learn what it takes to one day be their own agent. So it's not just about them helping me become more successful. I've got a responsibility back to them. Again, I'd like to thank you for joining us on the podcast. So it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. And I know that there will be some definitely both young and not so young agents that are inspired by your career and and your 30-year journey. If there was one thing that you would like everyone to take away or remember as a result of listening to this chat, what would it be? Having a clear understanding that, yes, they work alongside a brand or within a brand, but they themselves are a brand. If you're an associate agent working for a lead agent, you still have a brand that works alongside your lead agent's brand that works within a platform or within a brand. You know, so 
be very mindful of that going forward because the conversation or the people you meet today, it's funny, you know, if you have an impact on, on an individual, sometimes it can come back five years, 10 years later where you, you made a difference to someone and, and, and gave them an experience where they want to use you again. There was a sale I did, not last year, but the year before, where I had them in my car and I was showing them house after house after house and then they ended up buying through another agent and I congratulated them, wished them well. And then they called me 10 years later and I ended up listing and selling their house the year before last. You never know what a conversation today might lead to in the future. Yeah. It's like that um, that old expression, you know, people may not remember exactly what you said or did, but they remember how you made them feel. 100%. And so you'd be surprised how many people will watch you develop as an agent in, in the industry and people are watching and they, oh, there's another property that you might have come on. And for, for some people, they, they enjoy watching you succeed over a long period of time. There's a beautiful older couple who I met when I was 18. They said, we always said, Ben, we'd get you to sell our house and I sold it for them 25 years later. So it's it's a, it's an interesting, particularly if you work within a, a, a specific area. For a long time. For a long period of time. And people will watch and observe as you progress as both a human being and as an agent. Yeah, interesting. Ben Collier, thank you so much. No, it's a pleasure, Sam. Thanks so much. Thank you. To connect with all things Elite Agent, including the latest news, coaching and features, subscribe at our website, EliteAgent.com. 